It's not just a history lesson. It's a lesson about us, about human behavior. It's hate that's outlived generations. Oh, every minority is feeling this hatred. And it's on the rise. An attack against one religious freedom is an attack against all religious freedoms. It's cost millions of Jews their lives. But we had to wear this. Oh my gosh. That meant that we were subhuman. And continues today. A foot away from our front door was a pentagram. Around the world. We're not victims. We are Jewish. We're here. We're proud. Across the country. We need to be a lot more security minded. And right here in St. Louis. And when you see something, say something. I'm Mike Bush, and thanks for joining us for another program in our series, Race, Listen, Learn, Live. In the next hour, we're gonna tackle a difficult topic, rising hate in this country, in particular, anti-Semitism. The Anti-Defamation League reports that anti-Semitism incidents in this country were at an all-time high last year. So what is anti-Semitism? Well, it's a form of racism defined as a prejudice against or hatred of Jewish people. Now, people of the Jewish faith share customs, traditions, and histories. You can be born Jewish or convert into the faith. You can also be Jewish and secular. But at times in history, the Jewish people have been characterized as a race. Hitler and the Nazis believed people could be divided into races and that the Jews were a weaker, dangerous, and inferior race. With anti-Semitism on the rise, St. Louis isn't immune, which is why we're looking to educate, inform, and search for solutions. To help us do that, we'd like to introduce seven panelists from the St. Louis Jewish community who will share their experiences. Karen Oresti is the Director of Administration for St. Louis County Government. Deb Israeli is a registered nurse and the former mayor of Olivet. Rabbi Chaim Landa serves as the Director of the Chabad Jewish Center of St. Charles County. Helen Turner is the Director of Education for the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. Jay Greenberg is the Special Agent in Charge at the St. Louis Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Maxine Gill is a 2023 graduate of Washington University and Brian Herstig, he's the president and CEO of the St. Louis Jewish Federation. Now, to understand where we are today and move forward, it's important to look back at our city's history. Many metropolitan areas in the early 20th century had immigrant populations that created a rich, diverse community. Our Kelly Jackson found St. Louis was no exception. In the early 1900s, St. Louis was on the move and growing. The U.S. Census had the population at more than a half million, the city's immigrant population adding to its hustle and bustle. It was a very immigrant-friendly environment, and um, there was a very large population of Jews that had already come decades earlier, uh, mostly from Germany. And by um, the turn of the century, they were pretty well settled. Dr. Warren Rosenblum is an author who teaches history at Webster University. He says by 1907, 40,000 Jews were living here. Many of them had established you know, small businesses or in some cases had gotten lucky and built up pretty good sized warehouses or um, many were involved in textiles along Washington Avenue. There were great successes like the department store chain, Sticks Baron Fuller founded in the late 1800s. Famous bars flagship store opened in the Railway Exchange Building. The Jewish Hospital of St. Louis built in 1902 on Del Mar Boulevard, which we all know as Barnes Jewish Hospital today on Kings Highway. However, like many immigrants new to a different country, there were struggles. Once upon a time in St. Louis, we had an area called the ghetto that they referred to, which is where most of the Jewish community lived. And um, while Jews weren't literally forced to live in this ghetto, the fact of the matter is that um, it was the place where they could feel comfortable, where they could feel safe. And there were a lot of um, housing covenants that blocked them from some surrounding neighborhoods. There were also people who weren't welcoming. Anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head here during Hitler's rise to power and a pro-Nazi group spreading propaganda. In 1937, they paraded through Forest Park. Um, they gathered around a, a memorial that's still there, the memorial to Friedrich Jahn, who was a 19th century German figure, and they gathered around this memorial and they gave speeches and they waved Nazi flags and they marched around. 
Um, so events like this were very unnerving to the Jewish community here. And while the Jewish community was very tight-knit, bound by traditions, the more modern versus versus the more traditional, the one unifier was a high school, Soldan. It just happened that where it was placed, it encompassed a lot of the German Jews who were now doing a little better, a little more well-off, and these Eastern European Jews who were still struggling, ad adjusting to American life, maybe didn't even speak English all that well, but it, it captured the whole uh, crowd, and, and that was really kind of then, in some ways, the heart and soul of the Jewish community for a while. A collective who've left their mark on our community, from beautiful synagogues to industry and more. St. Louis was a very rich urban environment, rich in its cultural life, rich in its sense of you know, tempo and just rhythm. And, um, uh, and, and the Jews of the early 20th century loved that about St. Louis. Let's begin with your own experience with anti-Semitism. Karen, why don't you get us started? Oh, I was a first year law student at Washington University. It was 1987. And I used to get my hair cut at this posh shop. Location doesn't have to be named. Um, and uh, one day I went to have an appointment and the cutter said, well, would you come to get your hair cut in Fenton? And I said, why Fenton? At that point, I wasn't even sure where Fenton was because I was at Wash U most of the time and that was U City, right? And she said, well, I need to, to work out in Fenton because I have a non-compete clause in my contract. And um, it's all the fault of the Jew that owns this place. And I had seen her for about a year. We never really talked religion. Um, I, I, I don't know where it came from. I didn't know the ownership of the shop was Jewish. Yeah, it wasn't an issue. But it kicked me in the stomach. Um, uh, I think in the end, I left without telling her much of anything. I certainly didn't go back. Um, and I think it's why I ended up working for so many years in the Jewish community. I eventually worked with ADL for 20 years. At that moment in time, I was not an ally for myself. I just kind of stood back and let it happen. And I, I regretted that a lot, looking back. And Deb, I know you had a, a terrible experience. Right, so a few years ago, um, my husband and I were getting ready to go on vacation. And I was upstairs um, in our home in Olivet, um, getting my bags together and my husband yelled for me to come down and I, you know, like a good wife, I'll be there in a minute, no, come now. And um, right outside of our front door, it was maybe, gosh, a foot away from our front door was a pentagram spray painted. Um, some of the lights were still lit, there were tea lights and there was um, a pig's head in the middle. Um, I am not one to have a loss for words, but at that time I was completely dumbfounded. Um, I never really understood what it felt like to be afraid. And to be afraid in your own home is just a feeling that I wouldn't wish on anybody. Um, I immediately called the Olivet Police. Um, Karen got involved with it. The FBI got involved with it. Um, we still don't have any answers for this, but um, you know, I tried hard to kind of keep it as quiet as I could for a while and let the investigation play out. And then a couple of, um, I guess about a year ago or so, um, my niece who's going to school at University of Illinois, um, she was telling me that they were handing out flower, flyers about the pandemic and that it was a Jewish conspiracy, that Jews were involved. And I said, finally, I just, I have to let people know that even in our, insulated community of Olivet and where everyone on my street happened to be Jewish. Every single family on my street, this is happening. So, um, you know, I really needed for that story to come out. My experience is to bookend um, Karen's are more about the communities that I've been a part of. I haven't actually experienced them myself. Um, so between my freshman and sophomore year at the University of Wisconsin, there were a couple dozen anti-Semitic acts that happened. Uh, the last was uh, somebody cut the, the brakes on a camp bus for children going to a Jewish day camp. So when we got back to school, a group of us started a group that um, at night would just walk around the Jewish fraternities and sororities mostly to make sure that everything was fine. 
Um, it didn't happen to me personally. It impacted the community I was a part of, but I did and had the opportunity to stand up and advocate. And then I actually was a member of Tree of Life Synagogue and on the board in Pittsburgh. Um, and while I didn't live there at the time the attacks happened, I knew several of the people who, um, who were killed that day. But that to me um, also um, uh, shook me because uh, that was a place I went every Saturday. That was a place that was my place of worship. You know, it's, it's a different experience for those of us who have been through it because at, you can walk down the street and nobody necessarily will know that you are a, a, a Jewish person. They may not know it uh, as opposed to a, an Asian American, as opposed to a black person. Um, and so when it happens, like you said, Karen, it can be a kick in the stomach, but then what do you do? Um, I think a lot of what I've experienced sort of in my generation has been parroting a lot of this sort of edgy quote-unquote humor um, that oftentimes involves like Holocaust jokes and things like that. And I remember one time there was a fellow student in my class who in high school came up and drew a swastika on my desk while I was sitting there and just started spewing this Hitler-esque um, kind of anti-Semitic vitriol. and. Um, he just thought it was funny, and I, and I have seen both the side of um, kids thinking that that sort of thing is funny, and then also having it take a more serious turn in things like social media. We'll see um, sort of like rants on, on Twitter and whatnot that have a lot of thinly veiled anti-Semitism, and we'll see it as sort of a valid argument of things like, how did the pandemic happen? Why do Jews have disproportionate power in different um, areas of the United States and so I think a lot of it is just education and trying to talk to people and when I encounter that or someone shows me that explaining how it is anti-semitism. I am visibly Jewish so in terms of um, my experiences it kind of works both ways you you do attract that the the hate um, you don't get to really hear necessarily what someone really thinks because they know that you're Jewish um, but like I remember um, going to synagogue on Shabbat, crossing the street on Delmar, and you know people roll down their windows and say hateful things. Um, I lived in Brooklyn. I heard these things all the time. Um, it's almost natural. There's no follow-up. You don't get to have that conversation. And certainly, someone who has like um, any relationship with you, they're not going to say those things. Um, but just being visibly Jewish, you're almost a magnet for those touch and go. Um, so definitely experience those. If you believe you're the victim of a hate crime, and a hate crime is simply a violent or property crime that has a biased motivation, you should immediately pick up the phone and call the police. So if you believe your personal self or your property is in danger right then, the easiest way to get police there is to dial 911. We would then ask that you pick up the phone and call us at the FBI here in St. Louis or wherever you find yourself, or you can call us nationally at 1-800-CALL-FBI because we want to make sure that that incident is being looked at from a federal perspective as well as a state and local perspective and that every resource that can be brought to bear is being brought to bear. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it in America, we have very broad protections for freedom of speech. It's one of the founding principles of our country. And so oftentimes, no matter how bigoted or offensive speech may be, speech itself does not rise to the level of a crime, generally speaking, on the federal level. Um, that being said, we always want to get a report because where we see a rise in hate incidents, we almost always see a correlation of a rise in hate crimes as well. And it allows us the knowledge to get there and hopefully help protect the community before it comes under greater attack. The Holocaust is undoubtedly one of the darkest atrocities the world has ever seen. In a push to create a master race, the Nazis exterminated millions of European Jews. Rachel Miller of Chesterfield was a child living in France. She shares her story of survival with R.K. Quinn. It all started with Hitler, and we have a few people in this country that resemble him, and that scares me. At the age of 90, Rachel Miller has a profound sense of the past repeating itself, a past so vivid she can hold it in her hand. We had to wear this. That meant that we were subhuman. We had no right to exist. Born in Paris, France in the 1930s. This is my father. Mm -hmm. This is my mother. 
Her idyllic childhood was shattered at the age of nine. Her father died in a hospital in December of 1941. Months later, she was sent to live with a Catholic family in the French countryside. My mother said to me, Rachel, I'm going to give you a new name. Your new name is Christine, and you're not allowed to tell anybody that you're Jewish. Her older sister Sabine was to follow a day or two later. She never made it. Her mother, brothers, and sister were swept up by police in the largest French deportation of Jews of the Holocaust. Three letters from Sabine reached Rachel. She writes of how they shaved her beautiful blonde hair. She was dirty, she was sick, and she wanted out. Allowed to visit her Paris home one last time to get a doll, Rachel took something else instead. At nine years old, I took the most important thing, the only gift that you can never, never replace, the pictures. Shuttled from one foster home to another, sometimes enduring abuse and neglect, Miller became one of thousands of hidden children of the Holocaust. They took away everything. Everything. It's a hard thing to get over, very hard thing. Rachel was abused by the American soldier who brought her to this country at the end of the war. She went on to marry another man and raise her own family. Now, using her cherished photo album, she educates about the past and shares her deep fears about the intolerance she sees today. I want to scream because it pains me so. And it's not just about anti-Semitism. It's about racism, fascism, nationalism. Miller says she never imagined she'd live through another significant rise in intolerance. But she says the feelings she gets today are strikingly similar to the terror she felt in the 1930s and 40s. How can we stop them? That means that we need to have a government that is willing to stop them. And we don't have one. Rachel always held out hope that a member of her family survived, but in 2001, with help of the International Red Cross, she found her family's names on German documents that proved they were sent to Auschwitz and killed. Now, we are in a place that you may have never heard of, but is definitely worth your time. We're inside a local museum that not only shows the devastating impact of discrimination, but helps promote positive change. They were from all over places, Hungary, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia, Poland. In Krivkor, a somber history has found its sanctuary. Some survived, some didn't. Marking a time that should never be forgotten. They lived their normal life, and then all of a sudden, boom. Right? All hell broke loose. Yeah. You're inside the newly renovated St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum where every tour begins with a gravity point. That gravity point is what was the Holocaust. It's making sure that before we even walk in, we have an understanding of the depth and the magnitude of the events that we're about to engage with. Step inside, and there are lessons to be learned at every turn. Museums are spaces for questions, museums are spaces for inquiry, and museums are spaces for education, and that's what we came here to do. While the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic murder of six million European Jews, in many ways this horrifying history is a deeply personal story. So this is Evelina. The pandemic prompted St. Louisans to sift through their closets and attics. This is one of those very interesting artifacts. And longtime archivist Diane Everman here. received dozens of new artifacts from the families of survivors, like this doll named Evelina. She was given to one of our local survivors in Berlin right before Evelina, the little girl who lived down the street, was deported to Auschwitz and murdered there. A tiny shoe is also an indelible reminder of the youngest victims. This is a child's shoe from one of the killing centers. I find it really powerful. It's so little, it fits in the palm of your hand. Yeah. It's just a little shoe. There's a story behind every name here. And then on the wall. And in the final the section of the museum, a projection, a projection of hundreds of survivors who came to St. Louis post-Holocaust. Um, when we began to think about opening a new museum, we knew about 300 names. On opening day, we knew about 800. And now we know well over 900. Walking these hallowed halls gets you thinking about the nature of hate and injustice 
and the consequences of staying silent. And that is the point of this museum. It's not just a history lesson. It's a lesson about us, about human behavior, and about how we change it. Look how close they up they are. Remembering the past and being empowered to learn from it. Going forward, what gives you hope? I think what gives me hope is every day when I see people in this building. The new St. Louis Holocaust Museum reminding us all that we can and must do better. Yes, I've had anti-Semitic issues. I've had my manure desecrated in my old building. It's happening on college campuses across this country, how one Jewish organization is fighting back and teaching acceptance, lessons young people are sharing with their peers. We do have our, our differences, but we can all connect together. Anti-Semitic incidents surged to historic levels in 2022, with incidents on college campuses up nearly 50 percent. Our Justina Cornell drove to Urbana-Champaign to visit the University of Illinois and shows us the impact one organization is making. I'm Natalie. I'm Natalie. At this barbecue, it's more than food that's being made. New bonds are formed too. How are you doing? It's called Habbabikyu, the latest move to make memories. Well, the week after is two midterms, and it's like midterm, midterm, midterm. The Chabad Center for Jewish Life and Living is a part of a movement. The goal is to be this home, this space for all people to experience Jewish life. It has programming, space, study space, and most importantly, it's a place that people know they can come to 24 hours a day. Well, yeah, you're a senior, right? Rabbi David Tegtol has poured his heart and soul into Chabad for the last 21 years. He's witnessed hostility and hate firsthand. Yes, I've had anti-Semitic issues. I've had my menorah desecrated in my old building. A new report from the Anti-Defamation League finds these anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses jumped by 41% from 2021 to 2022, with nearly 3,700 incidents nationwide. At U of I in early 2022, a swastika was found on a wall inside a bathroom at a residence hall, and anti-Semitic flyers were spread on campus. Tagdo believes they are doing the work, but more needs to be done. At Illinois, we're proud to say that we work very hard to combat it, especially with a pro-Semitism approach. While the hate can bring division, Tagdo only wants to unite. I met a student once that carved an 11 and a half inch swastika in the table in a bar. And through my contacts, I found out who it was. And I said, do you realize what you did? He's like, no. A lot of hate comes from misunderstanding. So this is the arc where we store the Torahs. Understanding uh, the troubles is junior Jaden Pazel, um, president of the Jewish fraternity Alpha Epsilon Pi. I've definitely realized the importance of, of Chabad and the importance of just like that Jewish community here. Pazel is learning lessons beyond the classroom. He's now looking out for more than 100 members. Making sure everyone's safe is definitely something that I always keep in the back of my head. So you all live together? Yeah. That's exciting. That's why Chabad has become a home away from home. Barbecue is one of the ways we create that community. Pazel knows students are always on the move. This is a space where they can feel centered. Just the sense of community is, is really strong. Every week I'm here, I see friendly faces, I meet new people. Welcome guys, welcome. And the message that I was taught is that we're not victims. We are Jewish, we're here, we're proud, and we're here to stay. Karen, how do we fight anti-Semitism? because um, it's, it's very complicated to fight it because as the rabbi was saying, sometimes you just hear words and they, they keep driving. So how do you fight anti-Semitism? It's all about education and it's all within and without. Um, and to the extent that we experience these ups and downs, we call it now the rise of anti-Semitism, we could have that conversation every year because it never goes away. So we're always experiencing the ebbs and flows. Education is a constant throughout. Education changes though, right? Because now we can use social media to our advantage. We can come to this museum, which I think is only one of 22 in the country, as a unique learning space. We can bring um, information electronically easily into classrooms. But people have to want to step up and learn. 
the hardest part about the education piece initially when people explain a lot of incidents that happen to them is how do you overcome the initial anxiety and, and sort of cortisol reaction, right? So that you're not a bystander, so that you do become an ally for yourself and others, and you widen the circle. Um, and that's the thing about um, what I've seen in this community over uh, several decades, which is that people will step forward. They will support the Jewish community. As the director of education here at the museum, um, it's clearly the front and center of what we do. And we really believe in educating people about the past, about the Holocaust, about the history of anti-Semitism, which is a very long and complicated one. Um, but we've also built on to the museum with something called the Impact Lab. And it's doing exactly what Karen is mentioning, which is that it's one thing to learn about the history of the Holocaust of anti-Semitism. It's another thing to learn about what current anti-Semitism looks like, what all the things that you've shared look like, and then to know how to respond. In the Impact Lab, we really call it like a, a workout for your mind because it is practicing these scenarios so that instead of getting, you know, you do get that cortisol rush, you, you panic, you, you're not sure what to do. In the Impact Lab, we can play through those scenarios so you can literally practice um, so that when you're in a situation, it becomes more like muscle memory to know what to say, to know who to call, to know which community members need to be involved. And it just makes us all so much more prepared. Um, you know, I, I think to defeat anti-Semitism is going to take a very, very long time and, and so much education and pulling from all sides. But to be prepared to combat it is something we can do right now in the museum. You know, even more than even just education, get out there, meet your neighbors, make sure that, you know, you're, you're being protected in a, in a way that you feel safe. Um, you know, not necessarily, hey, would you come to my house if something happened? Just be out in the community and don't be afraid to identify yourself as being Jewish. And I think just being visible and making sure people know that Jews look like me, like you, like you, we come in all different stripes. And, um, you know, because I've, I've also heard, you know, you don't look Jewish. And uh, my answer back is, well, tell me what a Jew looks like. So, you know, we, we come in all different shapes and sizes. Mike, I, I just wanted to say two things about education. One, we're really proud of the fact that two years ago we were part of a coalition that helped bring a Holocaust education bill, which the state passed. So every child in the state has to learn about the history of the Holocaust. But the second thing that we're really proud of is what um, Helen was talking about, is that anti-Semitism is one-ism. There are a lot of them. And where anti-Semitism happens, racism happens, sexism, all the other isms happen. So education we, um, in, at the museum uses the Holocaust as a grounding point for talking about all of that, not just anti-Semitism, because those things are so closely linked and usually it's out of ignorance. The other piece in our community, at least, that's critical too, is just safety and security. And so while we focus on education, we also, through the community security program at the Federation, work with our 60 plus partners in this community to help make sure that they're prepared, whether that's training, whether that's helping them achieve nonprofit security grants through the federal government to harden their buildings so that they're less accessible, like we saw not just a couple weeks ago um, at, a, at, a, at a day school that was protected properly. So all of those things, because the day and age we live in, it's not just about talking. We also have to actively do things. So I, I was gonna add with the education, I think it's directly related to this as well. There's education about hate and where that can go, and just making people aware how terrible that is. Um, there's also positive, um, going beyond um, the fear, the hate, um, really educating people about Judaism, about people, um, humanizing the whole thing. Uh, if there's two key words, education and relationships. Um, and I think just creating those opportunities. Um, it's, it's more of a, I, I would say, an organic approach. Having someone at your Shabbat table that may not experience that Shabbat table. Um, connecting just on a human level. For me, being visibly Jewish and talking about the silliest things could be the most meaningful experience for someone who has never met a Jew or never met a, ra never met a rabbi. Um, but you have to be intentional about creating those, uh, those moments, uh, putting yourself out there. And there is a lot of ignorance. Um, and being patient with that too. Most people, I believe, are good people. And they're, tr they're trying to do good. 
I mean, that's what it is, and we've been saying that. That seems to be the theme. It's just, you know, introduce yourself and, and, and show that you're just like everybody else. It, it is about education. I think if we look exclusively at the Jewish community, we can find examples of anti-Semitism that causes us concern that it may be on the rise. But if we look at post-pandemic America and the world, we've seen a tremendous rise in anti-Asian hate and hate incidents and hate speech. And if we look only in our own country, post the Dobbs decision from last year, we have concerns about a rising tide of violence against Catholic institutions and pro-life um, institutions. And so being a part of a group or being a part of a community automatically separates us into us and them. And what I would encourage is each member of each one of these communities to sort of open their aperture and be welcoming and learning from other communities at the same time that we are teaching other communities about ourselves. Now, there's a local program where students are taking a unique approach to tackling anti-Semitism. It's connecting students of different faiths to break down barriers and build bridges in the fight against hate. On this day, it's Sekman High School in Imperial, Missouri. What I just blew is called a shofar. The it's best teachers might just be students. Loud, and it's used for a traditional uh, wake-up call. Which is why and Mr. Kirby is just an observer to today in his German language you classroom. I want to expose my students to the whole world, especially to things that they might not know about. The way my bat mitzvah looked. This lesson plan is being taught by four Jewish students. Another option that a lot of people tend to do is go to a Jewish day school. To pupils unfamiliar with Judaism. Something a lot of Orthodox Jews will do is they live really close to their synagogue because we're not driving on Shabbat. The goal so to I quell stereotypes and, and prejudice. When we connect and we see each other and when the students actually talk to each other, it breaks down those barriers. Lauren Abraham is the director of the Student to Student program from the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis. You'll hear in the presentation we give a lot of statistics about how we're such a minority, but religious-based hate crimes, so many of them are focused toward us. More than 100 teenage ambassadors volunteer every year to be part of the JCRC program. And after hours of training, they will visit more than 120 classrooms all over the bi-state area. For a baby boy, there's a bris or a break me law. 17-year-old Riley Fine says and she felt a responsibility a to sign up. Every minority is feeling this hatred and just kind of this sense of doom in the world that there's always this stuff happening and nobody's fighting against it. So I think that by coming into these classrooms, it is our way of hoping to change that. So this is how you would spell shalom. Each presentation is deliberately low tech. I have some props like this is a tour out that was given to me by my synagogue. And they touch on everything from holidays to the Hebrew language. Just so everyone knows, the Torah is the Old Testament. 18 year old Sam Deutsch told the personal story of his great uncle. It's an important thing to my family and to him. Who survived the Auschwitz death camp and became an educator. His philosophy was that if he spent the rest of his life wanting revenge and all that kind of stuff, that nothing would happen and anti-Semitism would go on in the world. Stories like that strike a poignant chord for Mr. Kirby. My grandmother and her siblings were all part of the Hitler Youth and my great uncle ended up in the SS. A chuppah represents a home that the couple is gonna make. Which is why he invites the program into his classroom every year. My uncle Fritz and I even spoke about this program that I'm doing here and how all of this helps the world be a better place. It's hard to measure the difference one hour can make, but for some, it seemed to have a lasting impact. It kind of makes me wonder, like, when did it stop being about the fact that we're all people? you know, regardless of cultural differences or traditions, ethnicity. Student to student. Or the best way to get rid of subconscious biases and stereotypes is to actually just interact. Shining a light to eclipse the shadows of prejudice. We do have our differences, but we can all connect together. Lauren, thank you so much for listening to what we had to say today. And building bridges of understanding, one lesson at a time. We're very divided these days, and I think it's refreshing just to have a conversation with a human being. He was a very ordinary man who, who really looked at a situation and, and step by step made choices that changed lives.
One man who made a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of Jews during the Holocaust, his connection to St. Louis. The threat is real, the new reality for local synagogues. Every single thing that we do, we have to think about security. According to the ADL, since 2022, there have been more than 120 anti-Semitic incidents targeting Jewish institutions. The majority of those have targeted synagogues. Our Christine Byers found out that safety has become an essential part of practicing the Jewish faith. When Rabbi Noah Arnell first joined the Kol Rina Synagogue in Clayton about 10 years ago, our doors were always unlocked. Then, in 2018, everything changed. Eleven people were killed at a Pittsburgh synagogue during Shabbat morning services. It was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in our country's history. Breaking news, the deadly mass shooting at a synagogue in Pittsburgh. Every synagogue in America realized that we need to be a lot more security-minded. Kol Rana started incorporating security measures into its every move. Rabbi Arnau and several members of the synagogue went through active shooter training. It's awful. And when you're done with it, you feel at least a little better. Maybe a little more scared, but also a little more prepared. Justin Sparks leads active shooter training at places of worship for Tier 1 Tactical Solutions. He's noticed an increase involving violence at synagogues and those who attack them. For whatever reason, they become hyper-focused um, in this case, on the Jewish faith and synagogues and the, the congregations therein. Spark says his company bases its training on real life events like the one that happened in Pittsburgh. We put them through the training so that they can see it and feel it and smell it and so that they can understand that when this day happens at their event, hopefully it never does, but if it were to, they will be prepared and know how to respond. Rabbi Arnau says he's glad he took the training. No one wants to imagine the worst possible thing that could happen to them. That's what active shooter training prepares you for. Security at synagogues like Kol Rina is also seen and unseen. Every single thing that we do, we have to think about security. And we've gotten used to it. It's like a muscle now, which is great. It means that we are safer and more thoughtful about everything that we do. And that takes time and money. If you want to practice Judaism, there's a significant security cost that the Jewish community has borne. March Clayton police cars often sit outside during times of worship. We don't expect synagogues to have to know their local police departments, but we do. And he says they need to keep their doors locked. Our doors are always locked and everyone is always welcome. In 1977, a white supremacist opened fire outside a Richmond Heights synagogue during a bar mitzvah. One person died, two others were wounded. That sniper was convicted and executed in 2013. Is there a right way to respond to anti-Semitism? Is, is there a right way? And I know, it, I guess it would depend on, you know, something like that happened to you and how you re respond to something like that by calling law enforcement. But may maybe it's just someone yelling something. Maybe it's something you see on social media. What's the right way to respond? You know, uh, if I may, Mike, I think that's a fantastic question because I think it's the one we all wrestle with, right? Right. Um, how do I respond? Um, and I think honestly, there's no, there's no right or wrong way. It's a spectrum of response. Like I, I cannot imagine your fear and what that must have felt like. And I don't think there is a right or wrong way to respond. But I think sometimes we can pack ourselves with a toolkit of what to do. Um, so again, for the museum, this all takes place in the impact lab. And we really use the acronym um, to act. Um, so the first thing you want to do is try and draw attention on um, what's happening. That might be calling your local FBI or police, or I'm um, taking a photo, notifying someone, telling someone what's happening. Um, then we always want to make sure that we offer comfort and care. 
That might be to ourselves, if it's happened to us, having so much grace to just feel all of your feelings, because again, I cannot imagine. But if you see someone else going through something, how can you offer them care? What do they need in that moment? Um, and then the final part of that acronym is to tell. Um, to make sure that we tell someone, an authority figure, um, someone who can help. And I think just having these kind of basic core tenets of what we could do, um, then you can really explore what that looks like for you. And every person's going to react differently. I always tell the kids, I'm, a, I'm an extremely shy person. So for me to stand up and say, you know, hey, you know, that, I don't like that joke. That's terrible. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm a very shy person. But what I do tend to do is I usually have a laptop or books or something with me, and I might drop it and draw attention to the situation. And that sometimes gives me a minute to think, um, just to be like, OK, what would I like to do next? Can I make eye contact with someone else in the room? How do I take a beat? Um, and then move on to the, to the comfort and the tell piece. Just to add to what everyone's saying, that fear and misunderstanding hides in the dark. So you have to bring things to light. You have to make people aware of what's going on. And I think that we Well, how do we do that? How do we bring things so to light? So by sharing stories like this, by um, bringing groups to the Holocaust Museum, by having your neighbors over for dinner, by um, doing community outreach, and let it be known, yes, I'm Jewish, I'm representing my community. Mike, if I can, so yeah. several years ago, Nicholas Prophet kicked in the doors of the Islamic Center in Cape Girardeau, <clears throat> poured accelerant all over the inside of the mosque, and lit it on fire. And unbeknownst to him, there were several residential apartments for rent there, and there were numerous families living there at the time. Fortunately, all of them escaped. Um, unfortunately, the Islamic Center was destroyed, and this was a violent attack against a religion of peace, rooted in misunderstanding. Sounds very eerily similar to what we're talking about today in a, in a different faith. Uh, the same is true on race-based crimes or on gender orientation or um, gender, gender orientation, sexual orientation based crimes. This is a misunderstanding that drives violent action. And so together we can have one much louder voice. And I think the other part of telling is that there is a great deal of healing that goes into telling. And there's a great deal of support that comes from talking about an experience. The Islamic Center received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of donations to rebuild their center um, far larger than the number of constituents they have in the Islamic Center. So I think that just goes to show the vast majority of people do not support you know, hate driven on misunderstanding. We all want the same things in life. When it comes to hate, we all wonder if we can make a difference. Well, in the darkest hours of history, one man emerged from the shadows as a beacon of hope. It's a remarkable story that has a St. Louis connection and changed countless lives forever. In the heart of Budapest, where the Danube River winds through a city steeped in history, a travel group from St. Louis recently took an immersive journey into a solemn past. There is no connection. There is they no followed in the footsteps of a man whose legacy still echoes today. He was a very ordinary man who really looked at a situation and, and step by step made choices that changed lives. His name was Carl Lutz, and to fathom his significance, we begin by retracing a path that started in a Swiss village and carries us across continents when the young man wanted to see America. And so we came here not knowing a word of English in 1913, ended up spending about five years in Granite City, Illinois. Lutz's connection with St. Louis continued in the 1930s when he went into the diplomatic service, eventually taking on the mantle of the local Swiss council. His office was 411 North 7th Street. If you know where the old Ambassador Theater was, he was in the offices above the theater. And he actually lived in the old Statler Hotel, which was right around the corner. His next assignment as a diplomat was in Palestine, then a British territory. He was there in 1939 when Germany's invasion of Poland ignited the Second World War. Karl Lutz was tasked as a Swiss diplomat to negotiate the release of about 2,500 or so German people from Palestine back to Germany. He also assumed the duty of aiding German Jews who feared returning to their home country. So at this point, Karl Lutz is introduced to something called Schutz Passes or protective papers. They were produced by the British and they gave their holders exile in Palestine. 
By 1942, Lutz's assignment led him to Budapest, where he confronted the harrowing reality of the Holocaust, bearing witness to the mass deportation of hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews to concentration camps. But the biggest thing he does is he remembers these protective papers, these Schutz passes that he had been introduced to in Palestine. Those who possessed them found themselves embraced by the umbrella of Swiss diplomatic protection. Lutz dispersed these crucial documents throughout the city, a prelude to designating 76 buildings for Swiss diplomatic safeguarding. Within these havens, he provided refuge for thousands of Hungarian Jews. There's a lot of different numbers, and we're still working on the, the final, but what we say is Karl Lutz is responsible for the largest diplomatic rescue mission of the entire Holocaust and rescued several tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews during his time there. Back in Budapest, the St. Louis travelers visited the Glass House Memorial Museum, a sacred site commemorating Lutz's actions. This is where Lutz began arranging false papers and safe houses. Sadly, Switzerland refused to acknowledge Lutz's rescue efforts officially until 1995, 20 years after his death. He explained his actions in a letter. As a devout Christian, he expressed that saving condemned lives was a matter of conscience. He might seem like, you know, a hero or you're this, you know, how could I possibly do that? But I think that Carl Lutz would probably say the same. He'd say, how could I do that? From St. Louis to Budapest, Carl Lutz's legacy transcends time. And so the message I take from it is you don't need to be incredibly powerful. You don't need to have any sort of position or talent or skill to do the right thing. Anyone can do the right thing, regardless of who you are. An ordinary individual rising to be an extraordinary beacon of hope and compassion. You can't be scared. You have to think of only one thing, staying alive. A powerful story of survival and how it will live on for generations to come. We'd like to thank the sponsors of this program, Carol Steinberg, Michael Steinberg, and the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. So if there is a message for the people who are watching today, um, this special is about anti-Semitism and, and how we can find solutions to it. And, and I'm wondering, what, what do you think the most important message that, that, that people should understand from this discussion? Rabbi? Um, I don't know if it's the most important, but I think it's important to the audience who's not Jewish, um, learn, engage, create those relationships. And to the Jewish audience, I think it's be proud, be strong, um, and just be confident in your Jewishness and when you see something, say something. Do something about it. Um, and between both of those things, I think a lot of this hate will dissipate. It will, it will never disappear. It's actually, it's interesting. Before our peoplehood, there was already this hate. Before the Jewish people became the Jewish people um, in the Bible, um, we are told Esau hated Jacob. And it's, it's just there, it's, 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 it's out there and we gotta deal with it. It's, it's never gonna go away. Come to the museum. Um, I expect, well, I, I'm happy to plug the museum. Um, expect to feel uncomfortable, that's okay. Um, expect to learn a lot about the survivor community and that's enormous because there were survivors and there are generations of survivors, many of whom now, because this museum refreshed itself, um, are coming forward in ways that they used to not. 
it's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, you, you were telling me you, you discovered after you opened the museum many more survivor yeah. descendants. Yeah, which is wonderful. I mean, we are um, we have a running list of people that we need to add to our digital memorial. So um, yes, our survivor community is large and vibrant. Um, we're delighted to be able to welcome those families in. Yeah, talk about people who have confidence now because this institution gives them a platform from which to teach others. Your advice from, from law enforcement's point of view? Sure, again, every situation is different. So uh, my advice to people would be trust your gut. If your gut tells you your best course of action is to just stay silent and let a situation pass you by, that's probably right. If you feel like you need to step up and do something or you need to act, then act with authority, act with confidence. Um, but what I would generally say is don't suffer in silence. The only way you're going to get help is if you let somebody know what's happening. So get yourself to a safe place and then alert law enforcement so that we can come and physically secure the area and then we can figure out what exactly has happened. But it's always better to let people know what you're experiencing. As a young person, what would you say to younger people, to younger ab people. about, about anti-Semitism? First of all, Jewish students who are younger, they're going to know what anti-Semitism is because they're going to experience it. It's not necessarily something that you need to inform them that it happens because from incredibly young ages, they're gonna be made to feel different by their non-Jewish peers. And a lot of that is pure childhood ignorance. Um, but I think there's also a lot of those sort of psychological belongingness needs when you're very young. And um, so a lot of the times young kids are less inclined to stand up against the hate that they're experiencing for fear of feeling othered and um, kind of furthering that hate. But so I think if I were to talk to some younger kids, I would say, don't let it go unaddressed. Don't be afraid to say, hey, that hurts my feelings. Um, and to start that educational process, because when it goes unaddressed, it just snowballs and becomes worse later. Um, and so being able to speak up, stand up for themselves, don't be afraid to stand out um, in addressing that anti-Semitism would be the advice I'd give. Years ago, little ones were not part of this conversation. Whether it's advances in education, social media, access to more information generally, little ones are in it. And you know, we used to say, oh, you wouldn't bring a child less than, what, 12? Because they wouldn't have the sophistication to understand what's going on. Now they do. And so even little ones, and you're right, little ones are gonna experience anti-Semitism. They are, they're gonna understand that other piece. So what are the tools we have to equip them with being able to stand up and say, that's not right for me, let's talk about this. I mean, I would say too, difference is an opportunity, not a threat. We're all, I was just looking, there's not a single shade of hair that's the same, there's a, like everything, difference is an opportunity, it's not a threat. We wanna leave you tonight with an astonishing story a bracelet has been unearthed in Germany and brought to St. Louis 77 years after it was made by a young teenager. That teenager made a difference as an adult just by telling his story, and he's still speaking to us years after he died. If we could get everybody to please take a seat, we'll go ahead and start. At the St. Louis Holocaust Museum, history is never forgotten. Today is the perfect day for this important ceremony. And on this day, a reminder why it's important so, to remember. It is an honor to be here. To the museum here. is getting a new artifact, a gift from a man who died more than five years ago, but whose memory will never be buried. He was quite a character. Uh, my father had an uncanny ability to just connect with people. I hope that nobody that lives would ever experience. Ben Fainer was a survivor of the Holocaust and one of the museum's most beloved ambassadors. Years after he had passed away, visitors were coming and saying, is, is Ben still here? It was very, very, very tough. He'd often turn the pages of his life story to educate school children, church groups, even members of the military. There was over 300,000 Jews killed in Buchenwald alone. He was one of those people who could shine a light. God bless you. too. God bless. Even after knowing darkness. Feiner was just nine when the Nazis separated him from his family. Over the next five years, he was moved to five different death camps. He once told us it would be like marching from one hell to another. You can't be scared. You have to think of only one thing, staying alive. Of 260 relatives in the Fainer family, Ben and his father were among only six who survived. 
For years, he filed away the pain in the cellar of his mind. But a few years before his death in 2016, he let it all out in a book called Silent for 60 Years. Once he started speaking, it was so healing for him to share his story and to be um, embraced by people. And now his story has another chapter. Not too long ago, after receiving a stunning email, his daughter made a trip to Germany. On the grounds of Buchenwald, a concentration camp from 1937 to 1945, researchers unearthed an extraordinary rare artifact, a bracelet made by Ben Feiner. It has my father's name in the center, and Ehrman is his mother's family name. My father carried his mother's family name at that time. It is believed that Ben made the bracelet while working at a Nazi locksmith shop and was likely discarded when it was discovered upon his arrival at Buchenwald. On the left side of the bracelet, the number 178873, the same number the Nazis tattooed on Ben Feiner's arm. Here, as a 14-year-old child of what he had been through, it's who I am, what they've done to me, the tattoo, the year that it happened. I mean, it's his identity. In this, in this piece of metal. His spirit, his soul will remain here forever. Back at the museum, which recently underwent a $21 million expansion. Ever so slightly, could you just tilt your hand? This new artifact, gifted by the Feiner family, will be displayed in a place of prominence. We have artifacts in the museum that really touch the heart. A child shoe, a food bowl, an, an ID bracelet, a uniform. But they're not really associated with individuals necessarily. I think it's, it's going to be very powerful and very moving. The Holocaust was a failure of humanity, but Ben Feiner was a triumph of the human spirit. This is his story and it needs to continue to be told and this is how it will continue for generations. After a journey of more than 75 years and 4,600 miles, some sacred history has finally come home. I think it's going to mean a great deal. And there you have it. Another program in our series, Race, Listen, Learn, Live. If you'd like to learn more, we would suggest you come here to the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. Truly one of the finest in the country. Thanks for joining us. Let's be kind to one another.